the uh, uh, Committee on Fiscal Affairs uh, to order, and then we'll go on to the Subcommittee on Audit, and then the Subcommittee on Investments. So starting off with the uh, main committee, the Fiscal Affairs Committee, uh, action item number one is the approval of the minutes from our last meeting on January 6th. I'll move, move them. Second. Seconded. Any questions, comments? There being none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, action item 1B is a resolution to adopt an in-state tuition rates for online degree programs at John Jay. I'll put forward the resolution and then um, move it, then we'll have a discussion on this. Uh, resolved that the Board of Trustees of the University adopt a revised schedule of tuition and fee charges for students enrolling in the online degree and certificate programs offered by John Jay College effective fall 2014 to charge all students uh, in the gra uh, in the graduate in-state tuition rates regardless of their residency and to charge a $75 online infrastructure fee uh, each term in lieu of the student activity fee. Uh, so that's the uh, issue. I'll move it. Do I have a second? Second. second. Okay. Uh, I think, have you all, has everybody read the explanation that was given out? And so it's pretty straightforward. The most important thing is to realize uh, that it the it's uh, actually um, the $75 fee is in lieu of um, uh, the student activity charge. Are there any questions? So uh, with regard to all of across the university, are all of our um, online courses assumed to be in-state? For the most part, they are School of Professional Studies, um, which has, by, by and large, the most online programs. Um, they charge the in-state rate for all of their online programs. School of Professional Studies also has this similar uh, online instruction fee, which is $75. So it is consistent with what we're doing <coughs> at the university. Um, as we said in the explanation, John Jay has another master's degree program that's online in their MPA, um, Inspector General program, where they are charging the in-state rate. And that's been, they've had good uh, response to that. Um, so it, it is consistent with what we're applying throughout, throughout the university. To the do they pay a technology fee as well? Yes. They do pay the technology fee. Okay. It, it's just, um, I'm, you know, I'm not questioning whether we should do it for this one, but just in general, the concept of everyone being able to pay in-state tuition just seems, and does is that competitive with our other uh, Throughout the country, it's, it's a mixed bag. There are some uh, public higher ed institutions that do it. I know West Virginia does it, char charges the in-state rate, even if you're an out-of-state student. Indiana State does it. So there are a few that do it. Um, in our research, it doesn't seem that, that there's any SUNY programs that do it, online programs. Um, but again, SUNY, SUNY does not. They, they have online, but they charge out of out state. Of state. Correct. Um, but again, there, there are um, other public higher ed institutions throughout the country that do it. And um, like I said, SPS is doing it for all of theirs. Um, so, you know, we feel that um, in order to be competitive and, and have students, you know, that's part of the motivation for wanting to do online programs. One of the motivations is so that you can attract a wider net of students outside of, of New York. So. We think um, charging the in-state rate will help the response rate for especially a new program like this at John Jay. I, I would just say I would, it, it troubles me. Yeah, let's have, we'll, we'll talk more about it. We'll talk and evaluate it as we go into the budget season. Sure. Okay. Any further questions or comments? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion aye. carries. You're so opposed? Yes. You're opposed? Yes. Okay. We have one in okay. opposition. How many did we have in favor? Um, one, two. We need three to move it. I, I withdraw my oppose with the. Do you need, do you have it? Is There's it approved? Three trustees. You need three vote. But does Terry vote? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, we got three. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, now we have information items. There's a. The, the agenda says that it, it's being given by Associate Vice Chancellor Matt Sapienza. I want to congratulate Matt. You're no longer Associate. You are the Vice Chancellor. Congratulations. Thank you. 
<laughs> okay, hello everyone. Thanks for coming out on this uh, on a snowy night. Um, as you all know, the governor issued his executive budget um, two weeks ago, and so I wanted to go through the highlights of what the impact is on CUNY and what some of the the, uh, the future holds in terms of what our budget situation looks like. So. Um, at all of your seats is our analysis of the state executive budget, so I'm going to walk through that. It's a fairly short document. Um, so if you could turn to page two of that document, we'll start with the um, we'll start with the senior colleges. Uh, thank you. This committee should get the same amount of paper as the curriculum committee does. Because <laughs> we're just as important. This is our contribution to sustainable CUNY. It's all here. We want to keep it and take it home with us and read it again and again. <laughs> so for the senior colleges, um, the state executive budget recommends a total of a little shy of $2.3 billion, $2 million, $2 billion, $256 million. Um, and it's an increase of $102 million over the current year. So it's a 4.7% increase. So again, the executive budget um, is giving us a, a stable condition from which to make plans for next year and is enabling us to, to make some investments. We do have some concerns about it, which, which I'll get into in just a minute. But you can see by the table on page two, the breakout of our three main funding sources, state, city, and tuition and the change from our current condition, the 14 adopted, and to what the governor is proposing. So the $102 million increase is basically made up of two components. One is a, about a $43 million increase in fringe benefits funding. Now, I know fringe benefits funding sounds kind of boring, um, covers our health insurance and pension liabilities and Social Security costs, um, but it's really critical that these costs get funded because they're by far our largest growing mandatory cost increase year to year. It's the way it is in many um, governments um, and universities, and, and we're no different in, in that respect. Um, so while it doesn't sound like a critical need, if you think about it, if this governor does not add these funds in the executive budget and the state doesn't fund it, essentially what we would have to do is use <coughs> the entirety of our tuition increase to fund these fringe benefit costs, and our students wouldn't get the benefit of the, of the tuition increase. So the fact that it's in the executive budget is a very positive thing, and it's welcome um, from all of us at the university. The other main component of the $102 million is the revenue from the tuition increase that's going to take place in fall 2014. It'll be year four of the five-year authorization for the $300 tuition increases, the annual $300 tuition increases. That generates about $60 million. But one thing that I want to make sure you're all aware of is that right off the top of that $60 million, 12, about $12 million has to come off to cover the difference between what our tuition is and the TAP maximum award. The maximum TAP award is $5,000. With the $300 increase next year at the senior colleges, our tuition is going to be $6,030. Um, so the additional $300 is about $12 million. And cumulatively, um, for the four years, it's going to be about $42 million in total revenue that won't be available to our colleges to spend because it will be needed to cover that, that gap between what the maximum TAP award is, and what our current tuition is. But it still leaves $48 million in new money for us to make investment on our campuses through the Compact Initiative. Um, there were some legislative items that were put in in the current year that the governor didn't include in his budget. A million dollar increase for the Joseph Murphy Institute, which is at the School of Professional Studies, and about $551,000 for SEEK. Um, and that's something that we're going to be making the folks in the <coughs> Assembly and Senate aware of and, and lobbying for restorations. Matt, what per is sure. this the trend for um, the percentage of students who are receiving TAP? Or are we, are we, is it 
increasing, staying stable? It's pretty stable. Um, you know, our enrollment has stabilized over the last couple of years, um, and the percentage of students receiving TAP has, has, been, has been pretty stable the last few years as okay, well, the percentage. percentage? What percentage of students received? Um, I believe last year we had, um, I think it was 97,000 students received TAP out of our 271,000 degree seeking students. So it's a little more than a third. And that doesn't mean they're receiving full TAP. No, no, right. 97,000 students in total received some TAP. Okay. Right. But they, they also could have tapped out, as it were. Uh, that's right. There are some. St and many of them tap out. Right. Right. So that the, Remember that, that number. Remember that graduate students okay. also raise right. the number that aren't right. eligible for TAP college right. now. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the number that really would you know possibly eligible for TAP, it's really more than half. Right. That's right. And students are only eligible for eight semesters worth of TAP. For the most part. Um, on the community college side. Um, the state executive budget is actually recommending a decrease of $2.8 million. But most of that is, again, due to legislative ads that were put in in the current year that the governor didn't include in the executive budget and which we have every expectation that the legislature will pull back once the budget's adopted for 2015. So some of those things are um, the ASAP program. Um, the ASAP program has been historically funded by the city, 100% by the city. In fiscal 14, we were successful in getting the state to add 1.7 million to supplement the, the city funding. Um, but again, it was viewed as a legislative ad, and so the governor did not include it in his executive budget. Um, there was childcare reductions, 544,000 in CUNY's budget was taken out for childcare uh, reductions. The same happened last year. The legislature put it back. Certainly hopeful that they'll put it back again this year. There's also a piece of the child care funding um, that is funded outside of CUNY's budget. Um, it's in the, the Office of um, Temporary Disabilities. It's $141,000. So in total, we're looking at about a $700,000 reduction year to year in child care centers. So again, that's something that's going to be um, very high on our list to lobby the Assembly and Senate to put back. It's also a small reduction uh, for college discovery. The main um, item, though, when it comes to community college funding is the base aid. Base aid rate um, this year is $2,422 per FTE. Governor proposed no change to that rate for next year. Um, and again, that I think it's a positive development in that. That's been the case for the last two years. The governor has proposed a flat uh, rate year to year, and CUNY and SUNY have been successful in working with the Assembly and Senate to build in increases of $150 per year for the last two years. And so we're working from the same level as we are this year. CUNY has requested $250 in base aid increase for the community colleges for next year. SUNY has recommended the same for their community colleges. So again, that's an item that's going to be very high on our list in terms of our discussions with the Assembly and the Senate. Um, on, quickly on page three, financial aid. Um, the governor didn't propose any changes to the TAP program. Um, so no reductions put in for the TAP. Um, and so that, that certainly is, is a positive development. It's been the case for the last couple of years. Um, we have that third bullet there. We just want to point out that as part of the federal budget, the maximum Pell Award is going up by $85 next year to, to $5,730. So that's a really good thing for our students. Um, also in the federal budget, um, we, we received an overall increase to our work study allocation, so we're very happy about that. And one last thing regarding financial aid and the state executive budget. The governor proposed a new program for next year um, called the STEM Scholarship Initiative. And he set aside $8 million for both SUNY and CUNY. And what the proposal calls for is that... $8 million apiece? No, $8 million in total, ju just for the first year of the program. Um, and what the, what the proposal calls for is that students who graduate in the top 10% of their high school graduating class if they decide to go to a CUNY or SUNY college and they major in a STEM discipline, they'll get to attend tuition free. Um, now, in looking at that, 
you have to, first of all, look at some of the challenges of that and that not all of the New York City public high schools actually rank their graduating seniors. Most do, but, but some don't. Um, so there are some challenges with this program. We've been having a lot of discussions with the State Division of Budget, with the <coughs> Higher Education <coughs> Services Corporation is gonna be administering this program about some of the challenges we're facing. But, um, but overall, we think it's positive in terms of not only rewarding good students, but um, in helping direct students into STEM disciplines. So we'll be working with the state now, as we go have forward to, Is this that. for any public, I mean, any high school? Is it private and parochial schools? No, no, I'm sorry, just public high schools. Oh, Public so high schools in New York State. Public high schools in New York State. Right, if they graduate within the top 10% of their class, attend CUNY or SUNY and major in a STEM discipline. So how do you, right. if, they, if they don't work for five years, will you go and collect the money back? Yep. Yes. Um, if they don't, it, um, if they don't persist throughout their degree or they change their major from a STEM discipline to another type of major, the uh, tuition-free aspect turns into a loan that they'll have to pay back. In addition, what, what uh, Vice, Chancellor Hirschen mentioned, Vice Chancellor Hershenson mentioned was part of the uh, proposed legislation calls for these students to um, work in New York State um, for a number of years in that STEM discipline which they majored in. So if you major in a STEM discipline and you go work as an accountant, um, <laughs> you'd have to pay it back as a loan. Um, or if you don't get a job, you have to pay it back as a loan. Um, so there are some things that that are in there that we're, we have some concerns about overall in terms of the the um, overall mission of the, the initiative. We think it's a good thing. But again, as, as usual, the devil's in the details. And we're working with the folks, um, like I said, in the Division of Budget and at HESIC to try to, to try to iron these out. I just might suggest to you that a student who's in the top 10% of his class, his or, his or her class, mm -hmm. and he is a STEM will have no difficulty getting a full tuition and admission to probably 90% of the colleges and universities in this country, <coughs> and that everybody's looking for that top 10% kid who is a STEM thing, but right. good luck. Right, and, and another factor in, in this program Chris, too is, is the fact that uh, a, lot of our, a lot of our students, as we mentioned earlier, are eligible for financial aid. And so if they get, if they're eligible for full tap, then they wouldn't be eligible for the scholarship. So when you start taking out all of these layers, the population of students that would come tuition free to CUNY wouldn't be that significant at this point, but, but hopefully if the program's successful, that'll, that'll drive more students um, to CUNY and into the STEM disciplines. So, so that's it on the operating budget. On the capital budget, um, the main piece that we just want to make you all aware of is that <coughs> the state executive budget did add $258 million in critical maintenance funds, which uh, we're really pleased to see that that allocation has been put in into the executive budget. Um, so we are working with the, all of the colleges, um, again, through Senior Vice Chancellor Hershenson's office and my office, trying to get the message out to the college in terms of what are those critical things that we we'll need to lobby the Assembly and Senate for. Um, Chancellor Kelly will be providing uh, testimony to the legislature um, later this week on Thursday. He'll be up in Albany providing testimony. Um, and again, with the expectation that not only is it election year, but the last three years, We've had on-time budgets. The expectation is we will have uh, an April 1st budget this year. Um, so we're hopeful to get some of the items restored that we're looking for to get a base aid increase and, and to work out some of the, some of the other issues that, um, that we need to see in, in the budget going forward. One last thing about the budget, and then I'll open up for questions, is the mayor is issuing his first preliminary budget next Wednesday on February 12th. Um, again, because it is his first budget and because he's only been in office for about a month, um, we're not expecting um, any significant changes to our budget. We think at this point it's going to be mostly just technical adjustments and that any policy type of uh, adjustments are going to be made in the executive budget, which will be issued um, around May 1st. 
So I'm happy to take any, any questions, if there are any, about either the state executive budget or, or the city condition. When is the CUNY compact up for renegotiation? Um, in June 2011, when the state announced the agreement on higher education, it was a five-year agreement. So in June 2016, that law sunsets. Um, so, so any future tuition increases past then or the maintenance of effort provision, it's all, it all sunsets in June 2016. We can set that together. Uh, the preliminary budget for the city is coming out um, next Wednesday, February 12th. All right. Are there any further comments or questions on that? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the Committee on Fiscal Affairs, and then we'll go into the Subcommittee on Audit. So moved. Seconded. Um, all in, yeah, we're going. <laughs> Subcommittee on Audit, uh, the, the item here is, you know, well, thank you very much, um, <laughs> is the approval of the minutes of the meeting on December 4th. I'll move them. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 So today we're going to have an in, we're going to have, we're going to have a presentation, hello Shelley, hold on. We're going to have a presentation by KPMG on the A1-33 audit report. Uh, we're going to uh, get the review and uh, we're going to approve the report subject to final review. We've got with us on the phone uh, Shelley Massey, the partner on the account, and we also have with us in the room is John uh, Usano, who's a senior manager uh, on the account. I'll let you two decide who goes first and how we go, but here's the presentation that they'll be talking from. Okay. All right, I, I will begin, and I just want to apologize for not being able to be there in person. But um, I didn't think I could make the drive in, so. Um, I think you should have two pieces of um, information in front of you. John passed around in a PowerPoint presentation, and you should also have the draft A133 report. The draft A133 report is on your iPad, and it's the last item on the uh, uh, SCA document page on the first one. It's the full 80-page report. Yes, yeah. yeah, just to clarify, the A133 report includes the first opinion, the financial statements, and all the footnotes that we previously issued back in December when we issued the financial statements. So the A133 additional information is the schedule of federal awards and those notes and the last two opinions. Um, but I'm going to start by going through the presentation that John passed around, and then we can take any questions on the report at the end if you have any. Um, so moving to slide one, the agenda today uh, is the A133 audit. We will discuss the audit overview and the results of the audit, and then there are some current updates with respect to single audits that will be applicable um, over the next few years that we have summarized for you. On slide two, I have included the objectives of a single audit, and there are three. First, we determine whether the schedule of expenditures of federal awards is presented fairly in all material respects in relation to CUNY's financial statements. We also obtain an understanding of the internal control over compliance for each major program. <coughs> we make assessments of control risk, and we also perform tests of control over all of the different compliance requirements. And then lastly, we look at CUNY's compliance over these areas and determine whether or not they have complied with all of the compliance requirements that are direct and applicable to the major program that we are auditing. I'm going to turn it over to John now, who's going to go through the specifics of what we audited. Thanks, Shelly. So turning to slide three, uh, Really, this slide summarizes the general approach and process that we undertake in determining what may be a type A major program or a program that is subject to A133 review by us. It really starts off with a, a mathematical computation that looks at a dollar threshold, typically 300000 which is what was used at CUNY. When you look at your total expenditures, so there was about $883 million in total expenditures on the CIFA this year. 
SFA or your student financial aid cluster was about 881 million, obviously your largest program. You also had about $2 million that was from disaster recovery from the Hurricane Sandy funding and also some tail end of the Irene uh, funding as well. And in that process, once we've identified these two, we're, we have to undertake a risk assessment where we look at all type A programs, which these pierce the threshold for, and we consider the risk assessment, whether it's high risk or low risk. A high risk program is automatically determined to be needed to be audited and tested in the current year. There are certain criteria for low risk programs that are also contemplated where you're looking at if the program had been audited in the past two years, if there were any findings or material weaknesses or, or um, any funding in the past that may have included recovery money uh, and the likes that are here. Given that last year the audit report was clean and unmodified or unqualified at that point, um, we were able to assess that both programs for this year were low risk audit programs. However, there is a computation that has to be done where, the, where you need to cover at least 50% of your total expenditures. As such, we tested student financial aid this year. We did not have to cycle. We chose to elect to cycle the uh, federal money that came from the disaster recovery, as it, provi it wouldn't have provided you enough coverage uh, for the current year. There's also a requirement to test uh, or assess type B programs, uh, which is at the level of 100,000. Again, <coughs> given that we've already assessed 99% of the federal aids as type A, there really weren't any type Bs that pierced that threshold. On slide four, here we outline the programs that were audited. As I mentioned before, the major program that was audited this year was student financial aid. Uh, we did visit all schools at CUNY this year, consistent with the approach that we've undertaken in the prior years. Um, and when we do our test work on slide five, there's a host of compliance requirements that need to be reviewed. Um, you know, when you look at the first slide and uh, at the slide and you look at allowable costs and eligibility, there's, there's certain requirements and tests for when aid can be distributed, whether it's for Pell or loans and the likes. There's certain dollar thresholds and compliance requirements that need to be met. We review those awards <clears throat> based on our sample selection. We look at processes over cash management. We look at drawdown awards and requests that are required. There's also a slew of uh, special tests that are required, whether it relates to uh, verification of certain individuals, uh, disbursements uh, to students <clears throat> or return of, of, of aid, depending on whether a student withdrew from school or, or changed status. We look at the computation, <laughs> the timeliness of that information to ensure that it's being done properly and timely and uh, in accordance with the guidelines. There's also enrollment reporting for status changes and certain uh, requirements that are done for loan processing. Uh, notification is one of the compliance requirements that is required to be looked at as well as institutional eligibility. Uh, we reviewed all that, and I will turn it over to Shelley to go through the next slide, which really outlines the results of, of the procedures that we performed during the year. Shelley? All right, well, um, on this slide, the most important bullet is the fourth bullet down that states that there were no audit findings that we needed to report. So once again, the second year in a row, we have a clean report with no findings that uh, we needed to include, which is great news. Mm -hmm. We conducted our audit in accordance with auditing standards that are generally accepted in the United States, as well as the standards that are applicable to financial audits contained in government auditing standards. And all of the requirements that John went through on the previous slide um, are all compliance requirements that are prescribed to be looked at by the federal OMB Circular A133. So our audit of compliance is performed in accordance with that circular. And the federal government puts out a, distributes a compliance supplement that we utilize as an audit program guide, and it provides us with the information that they want us to consider um, an audit for uh, most of the of the programs that are out there um, and, and financed by the federal government. So we do utilize 
um, information <coughs> provided to us when we are conducting our audit of compliance. Currently, um, everything has been through John and my review and is with the concurring partner. So she is going through the A133 report and all of the audit documentation. We have a firm, a KPMG requirement that our concurring reviewer needs to look at certain documentation in our work papers. So she is currently doing that. And once she is complete with that process, we will perform our final down-to-date procedure, holding subsequent event discussions. Um, obtaining management representation letters, and then we will be issuing. And I expect that by the middle of this month, we'll be in a position to issue the report. Any questions on anything that we spoke about before I touch upon some of the new uh, requirements that uh, OMB has issued in the last month? Uh, Shelley, the, the, you say there were no audit findings, and that's that's excellent, uh, excellent news. Uh, were there any things that you would like to share with the committee that didn't rise to a level of a finding? Um, yes. I mean, there were a few items that did not rise to a finding. They will be included in the management letter that we will be providing um, later this month. Um, but there were some instances where we noted the uh, cost of attendance of students. When somebody drops a semester and their cost of attendance changes, it ultimately could impact the federal funding that they receive. And there were a few instances where we noticed that the cost of attendance wasn't adjusted upon a withdrawal. And that was simply because they knew that they had adjusted the correct aid but yet it wasn't documented officially in the file. So we have recommended that procedures be put in place that going forward, when that happens, that it officially um, be documented so that we know that they thought about, you know, the reduction in aid. Thank you. Yep. Okay. If there are no further questions, I'll go through the last two slides, which discusses um, some changes that the OMB have issued with respect to the circulars that cover um, the A133 audit. And this was issued on December 25th, so I guess um, the federal government didn't have anything better to do on Christmas than issue uh, some very significant new regulations. <laughs> but it became effective the following day and will be in effect for all federal awards that are provided after December 26, 2014. So what that means for CUNY is their audit for June 30th, 2016 will have some um, significant changes to regulations. Um, there are some changes that I've noted on the next slide that talk about some of the thresholds that John mentioned. But there are currently three different circulars that not-for-profit organizations need to follow when they think about their requirements of an A133 audit. A121, A21, A122, and A87. And those are all being combined into one circular. But some of the changes that the A133 audits will have in the next few years are listed here on the last slide. The single audit threshold, and this is what's going to require an organization for an audit, will increase from 500000 to 750. Now, that is not something that will impact CUNY since you're way over that threshold. Mm -hmm. But the next item, which is the Type A, B program determination, has been modified from 300000 to 750000 And this could potentially impact CUNY in the future. If there were ever programs that were between 300000 and 750000 in the past, first time we would be required to audit them. Um, part of the uh, you know, last three-year look back, if they hadn't been audited, if they were new programs, we would be required to audit them. So that 300000 has jumped up to seven hundred and fifty. The threshold for performing risk assessments on Type B programs has 
also increased from the current 100,000 to 25% of type A threshold. Threshold for reporting question costs have increased from 10,000 to 25,000. The percentage of coverage requirements has been reduced from 25,000 for low risk to 20, and then for high risk auditees from 50 to 40%. And the next one could have a very um, significant impact on CUNY. In the past, if you had a significant deficiency in internal control finding in a major program, it was automatically required to be audited in the next year. That now has been removed and the requirement has been increased to a material weakness threshold. So potentially there was a program, for example, if the FEMA program last year that we had audited had any type of internal control finding, it most likely would have been a significant deficiency that would have needed to be reported, and we, we would have been required to audit that again this year. So that threshold has increased to a material weakness. So requiring less programs to potentially need to be audited two years in a row. And the last item, and I think when we last spoke about this, I mentioned that the OMB was contemplating changing the compliance supplement to reduce the number of compliance requirements to be audited um, for major programs. Now that has not been addressed yet in the new guidance that was just released, but will be um, addressed going forward in the compliance supplements when they are released in the future. So some of the compliance requirements may get combined. Uh, some of them may be dropped from the compliance um, supplement. So changing the audit requirements that auditors will have to consider in the future. So while you know not applicable right away, it does give um, organizations time to you know look at some of the changes in the circulars. And I believe CUNY participated in a webcast that KPMG held um, two weeks ago about this topic. So we have already started to address this with our clients, and will be over the next you know year or two um, quite frequently. I'm I'm sure. Okay. Any questions? Any comments or questions on that presentation? Or I'll be happy to address anything within the A133 report itself. Alan? Um, <clears throat> in my first month at CUNY, I got a call from the federal order about 8 o'clock at night. So I just wanted to let you know I'm sending you a letter tomorrow of fining you $8 million. <laughs> and when I looked at why we were being fined, I saw that, you know, we had refunds that should be made, but some of them were $15, $19. We'd also made a decision to be judged as a university rather than individual colleges to make it easier for our students to transfer with their financial aid. And I really had doubts whether we could ever truly get into full compliance for this. We met with the state auditors, explained our situation. They were incredibly unsympathetic. So to be sitting here now for two years in a row um, with no material findings, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Matt Sapienza and his staff, and Gordon Taylor and his staff, and Barry Kaufman, and um, Bob Tatchik was not with us today, but I want to thank all of you. Um, it was a remarkable finding, non finding. Shelley, uh, the, when it says major program for material weaknesses, how do you define a major program? A major program is a program that we're auditing. That's really the definition. Oh, so, okay. <laughs> as John had mentioned, on your schedule of federal awards, you had three programs, three federal programs that are included. But we only way. audited student financial assistance, so that's considered the major program. Okay. okay. You, Joe, if you turn to page 65 on this document, that's what yeah, I don't have, uh, well, I'd have to flip. Yeah. I'll give you mine. It'll no, that's okay. All right. What is it? It just shows, it lists the programs. Got it. Okay, I'll look at that on page 65. All right. Are there that's, any? That's 84% of the total, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. You know the report that we do separately from the university report that looks at the funds that are held at the college level, the various different, um, you know, the Queens College Alumni Fund or whatever they're called, these various different trusts. The auxiliary trust The auxiliary organizations, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Does well, this will, I guess this is for the account. Will this pertain to them or not? No. It it's, will not. No. Okay. This That's just good. covers the university. Mm -hmm. 
the individual auxiliaries and associations and child care centers have to have their own audits, and those audits would follow the A133 for their auditors to do the same kind of a report. So they are subject if, to it, subject to their own. If they for it. I got it. I got yeah. it. Okay. Generally speaking, the money is sitting in the university, so we don't see a whole lot of it there. Mm -hmm. okay. But occasionally there's a grant that pops up. Right. We hope it's below the threshold. Any questions for the folks at KPMG? Okay, there being none, I understand we have to accept. What do you, what's the, Miriam, if you could explain what we need to do? What I'd like the committee to do is to accept or approve the report subject to the final pieces so that we will be able to file it once we're done, which is the normal responsibility of, the, of an audit committee. Okay, move it. Second it. Any questions, comments? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. I want to thank you, uh, Shelley, um, for coming on the line, and thank you, John. Uh, I'll move a motion, um, and I need a second, to adjourn this meeting and to go into the Subcommittee on Investments. Second. All in favor, let's move into the Subcommittee on Investments. The action items here are, actually, there are three items, even though it doesn't say it. The approval of the minutes of the meeting on, on November 4th. 2013, I will move the approval. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Any questions, comments, any changes? There being none, all in favor say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? The motion carries. Um, first, we're going to have an update um, from Janet Crone. Is Janet here? No, Janet. Well, unfortunately, Janet's ill today, but um, we're going to get Mark Fowler from Cambridge Associates on the line, and he's going to give the performance update, and then we're going to executive session to talk about uh, the specific issue we're having with one of our managers. Mark Feller. Mark, it's Joe Loda and the Subcommittee on Investments at CUNY. Well, hello, everyone. Okay, we're, we're up to that part of the meeting where we're going to get a performance update for how we've done for the month. Janet is not here. And then your presentation, uh, which we will, before we go into that presentation, go into executive session mm -hmm. so we can have a conversation about our managers. Okay. Uh, would you like me to uh, talk about the markets, or should we just uh, uh, talk about CUNY performance? Have, for have, have you seen um, the update that Janet wrote to all of us uh, on on the market, the investment update for the calendar? Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, I have. Okay. If you can just give us a general update as to where we are in the market at this point in time. And, okay. Uh, uh, through ahead. January? Yes. Okay. So, so my estimate for January is uh, you're down about uh, 2%. Uh, this is very preliminary, and it will depend on uh, some manager performance. We had some mutual funds to use. Uh, in some cases, we were just relying on market indices. Um, so that's through January. Uh, I, I think uh, so the markets are down about 4%, so you're down about half that. Uh, and uh, what's interesting is that uh, the things that drove some of the underperformance last year and outperformance for that matter have been a mirror image as to what's working this this past year so uh, uh, one of the biggest disappointments about last year was some of the active managers uh, particularly on the international equity side did not perform well didn't keep up with the markets any manager that was uh, focused uh, on quality or worried about the macro environment uh, tilting a little bit defensive uh, trailed uh, meaningfully, and uh, I guess one of the poster trials of that would be IVA in your portfolio. Uh, IVA uh, couldn't find things to invest in last year that met their uh, valuation um, uh, parameters, so they started raising cash. Uh, so they underperformed by a, a big amount. Uh, this year they're down about 1.2%, uh, so outperforming the markets by about uh, 3%. Um, the other things that uh, uh, didn't work last year, um, or, or that did work, were uh, tilt toward shorter duration bonds and a little bit of an underweight to fixed income. Uh, that hasn't helped this year. Uh, so I think you're, the end result uh, is that you're going to outperform the benchmark by a little bit in January, uh, but not by much given some of these uh, tilts that worked against us. Uh, and then through today, you know, with the market being down uh, uh, about 2%, uh, maybe that 2% down for January turns into negative 3 uh, through uh, uh, today. 
I'm happy to go into more detail about any of the managers, but that's the, the high-level update. And, and share loader if I can. Um, Janet Crohn's memo, which is mm -hmm. part of the materials, also provides an update. Now that calendar year 13 is closed out about how the pool performance for the entire calendar year. Mm -hmm. um, and so for 2013, we, re we had a return of a tw about 12.6%. Um, are there any questions before we go into executive session? I'll uh, thank you. I will entertain a motion to go into executive session. Uh, second? second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We're in executive session. Thank you. Cameras are off.